Barbara Prey did a piece on the X-43, which was the fastest. 2004, it broke the Guinness Book of World Records. I think it almost reached 7,000 miles per hour. And um, you sort of get the idea of the speed in this piece. It's a very large piece. Jim Cunningham um, did a piece for Hubble. I think Mike Carroll might have known him. Um, um, and this was before the images came out. And uh, I think there's a lot of symbolism here with the mirrors. You see the sort of the concentric circles and, and, and just a very powerful piece. Very large piece as well. I have to sort of enunciate that artists don't get very much money. I think the, com the current commission is, is $2,500. So they're doing it basically out of love for the agency. They know that we're a government agency. We don't have a lot of money. And in fact, I have no budget this year. Next year, I hope to have a little bit of one. But, um, but um, so they, they understand. And I think you get a lot of interest also from a lot of more known artists as well. Nathan Green did a very, very, Green did a very, very big, large-scale piece on the Gamma Ray Observatory. Again, very illustrative and wonderful. Doug and Mike Starn, who are big artists, of, um, uh, photographers and artists, um, interwove for that. This was a piece for the SOHO mission. It's not a very good reproduction of it, but there's a sun in the center, and then there's a book in the, in the bottom. The idea is that the book represents knowledge, and there's all sorts of symbolism of, of understanding the sun and what SOHO did for the sun. Dan Zeller did a piece on Titan, which is right here, one of Saturn's moons, and um, quite a wonderful piece as well. Very intricate. Russell Crody, who's an artist out in LA, he did a piece uh, called Mars Part Two. Uh, he did a series of pieces. He actually went to Mount Wilson and went, looked through the telescope there and, and, and looked at Mars very carefully. And then he wrote this sort of stream of consciousness uh, poetry all around the piece, which is quite powerful. He has his own observatory, actually, in Malibu. He has a little um, observatory there that he built in like a shack. It's really cool. <laughs> Judy Eisler did a piece on the uh, Mars ex Exploration Rover, on the Mars Explorer Rover's Spirit and Opportunity. And what she did was she took the animation and she sort of found the spot that she thought best represented where the robot, the robotic elements and the technological elements sort of met with something more human. So you actually looks like an embryo. And it's sort of interesting. And she said when she first caught this moment, she started to cry. <laughs> and that the idea is that she sort of touched upon the humanization, which I think George Butler, we worked with George Butler very caref uh, very much on roving Mars. There's this sort of humanization of the rovers, which you don't see. It, it has this sort of extra special significance, I think. And George really captured that in roving Mars as well. Yeah, I'm just about done. These are the last ones. Evie Day did a piece called um, Wheel of Optimism where she actually got a sample of a real Mars rover tire and um, created a terrarium inside of it of Mars. And then Renwick, this is the last one. He did a piece called Mission to Mars, which is, um, he had envisioned in 1990 what, what Martian exploration would be in 2019. Obviously, we're not there. But um, this was his visions of that. Um, lastly, in the 19... The 1990s, um, latter 1990s, uh, Dan Golden, the administrator of NASA, sort of tasked us to reach out to different art forms. And we were able, and we got a little bit more money, and we were able to commission some really interesting pieces by the Kronos Quartet and Laurie Anderson and different people. Um, Nam June Pike, we did some, pe some work with. Um, and we also did some work with the National Symphony with Emile Deku, who's here today. Um, this was a piece we had commissioned back in 2002 called Sun Rings, which had traveled around the world and was about the Voyager mission and basically was based on an experiment by uh, Don Gurnett um, called the Plasma Wave Experiment, which was trying to track the sounds of space as part of the Voyager mission. And it was the 25th anniversary of the Voyager mission, so we thought we'd commission a piece using these sounds of space. So the Kronos Quartet got in, in touch with Terry Riley, who's sort of the father of minimalism, um, and, and the piece was created and has since been really wonderful. I actually had a clip which I left at my office and I was really bummed. <laughs> but I do have a clip for you with the National Symphony with Emil that we did for on Monday, uh, the 20th. Well, actually it was on the 18th, but it was in honor of the 20th, which is indelible in of our minds because there was so much going on. Um, but we did a concert with the National Symphony which incorporated film footage. This was from film footage. Duncan Kopp created a documentary called In the Shadow of the Moon. Um, uh, has reissued an old NASA commissioned movie called Moonwalk One. And um, in this piece, there's the 2001 theme, the Strauss theme, and uh, which Emil's conducting. And I have a little snippet for you, which I hope works. Oh, shoot. I have to find the screen here.
myself at the right spot. And I'll move it over to Emil, but thank you so much. This is from our concert on July 18th that we did in honor of the Apollo 11 moon landing. And I don't want to interrupt Buzz Aldrin. It's like a, some sort of sin or something. I'll, just let, I'll let him talk. I had written three narrations for uh, the movements from Hulse to Planets that started the program after Moonwalk 1. And there's... Jupiter, of course, that we ended as the last of the three excerpts we did. This started out in... Oh, it just, it just sort of jumps around a lot. Oh, I, don't, I don't know how to work the volume here. That's the opening where the concert, where the concert master comes out. We started it with the theater in blackness and President Kennedy's famous speech that he gave at Rice University as an excerpt. And then it went straight into the Moonwalk One uh, sequence with uh, a beautifully and very powerfully cut uh, images of the Saturn V from Apollo 11 with, with this iconic music that he even won up to Kubrick, I think, not to mention Strauss with his opening sequence. It was just, just terrific and very powerful. And this started out in 2006 in a collaboration that I did first did with NASA at Wolf Trap at the National Symphony Orchestra where I work. Uh, of, uh, a whole second half program with uh, special uh, narration written specifically for Leonard Nimoy and new images put together from NASA and NASA television uh, that were broadcast in the Five Moon Center and on the lawn and were beautifully together. And I think looking back at this project, if this were, if this, this is the seventh uh, collaborative program I've done with, with symphony orchestra and images from NASA. And looking back, having spent, as we all have, a lot of time looking back in 1969 and the 60s in general, and those amazing artwork that you started out with looking at from the 1940s and 50s, I, I, I think that programs like this and a lot of what we're talking about, the importance of art, and music and science and imagination are something that's somewhat lacking in our common dialogue today when we talk about exploration and sciences. There used to be a much closer overlap between the imaginative source of science and art that was shared in years before, in the 50s and even before, that caught so much of our imagination. I mean, that's why everybody is here in this room today, not so much because of some hard scientific fact you read as a child, it was looking at Amazing Stories magazine or watching Star Trek or Lost in Space or something even later, uh, Spielberg film. It could be almost anything, but it starts out with imagination. And that's something I always, uh, it, it seemed one of these obvious thoughts, but it was after our collaborative program with Nimoy at, at Wolf Trap where he was talking with some people from the Park Service who came back to say hello. And he said that that is really the, the, the one thing that really shares a very deep and strong commonality is that both of those disciplines start out with this mysterious pool of imagination and, and what does not yet exist and how it comes to be. And I think these concerts have been so satisfying. There's uh, Scott Altman, who is our other narrator, uh, space shuttle commander next to Buzz. And what, what, what made this evening so special for me and for my colleagues on stage and the people in the hall uh, what was that in, in a funny, odd way, combining things that seem a bit disparate, light music, serious music, images from, uh, from the surface of the moon, uh, Dvorak opera arias, uh, John Williams music, the U.S. Army chorus, Gene Krantz. It was a, a, an amazing, uh, I think, inspired grab bag of, of people and events that came together as a, as a whole and was I think informed in that sense of imagination and hopefulness that we had in 1969. 1969, people were not so embarrassed to dream in public and feel 